thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm very, very honored to be here. And, uh, and it is a pleasure to come back here. I did love law school when I was here. I really did. Uh, I think some of that was because I didn't go, I, I took a 15 year break before I came back. And it gives you a different perspective on going back to school. So I thoroughly enjoyed my time here. And, uh, and it is a delight to come back. So I want to begin by, um, I, because it, it's not a written uh, paper, acknowledging some of the borrow from um, Richard Powers, who has written a marvelous book, the Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Overstory. It's about trees, not about the law, um, but it's about trees. But I liked the idea of the overstory because then to me it just implies that there is an understory. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that because it's one of the themes I see in Canadian law. One of the problems, and perhaps one of the tensions in Canadian law, is that I think we have an overstory and we have an understory. And I think our overstory is essentially the um, idea of justice and what is justice. That's the broad, the broad, broad reaching idea is justice. The understory, and this is, I swear to you, I was writing this before the wet sewing <laughs> situation came up, but the understory is the rule of law. And does the rule of law have anything to do with justice? Are they separate? Are they related? Um, are they the same thing? These, the, none of these are new discussions for um, legal academics. But I want to illustrate this in particular by talking about Canada's indigenous people. Because I think we pose a different, uh, we raise the overstory and the understory in ways that non-indigenous people simply don't. So I'm hoping I can make this work. I don't quite know where to point it. Okay, so I want to start with early images. I want to talk about justice first. And the whole idea of justice and what it is, and I want always to look with images. I'm very interested in symbols, and I think symbols are very important. The reason I beaded that two-row wampum belt for this school was because on day one of law school, I walked into this building. It didn't look like this. You've renovated since, but and there was a big brass plaque, and it had written on it some words from the Torah. The source was less important to me than one statement there that said, and I'm probably going to paraphrase or, or misquote it, but it's to the effect of there shall be one law for you and the stranger among you. And on my very first day of law school, I, it stopped me in my tracks because I stood there saying, well, that's not right. That is absolutely wrong. It, there is not one law. Here. Indigenous peoples have their own law, so they, that's not right. And if it's for you and the stranger among you, then you're, you settlers, you're the stranger. You should be living by our law, not the other way around. So as a result of that, I got together with the Native, we called ourselves the Native Law Students Association back in those days, and we cooked up the idea of creating the two Rowampum Belt and gifting it to this university so that this university would have a symbol of another way of looking at things. And we brought in the Gazwenta from Six Nations to talk to us about the law and ask if it was okay to do this. We, he said absolutely and he taught us more about it. We gifted it to this university and I'm really happy that it's still <coughs> hanging here as a symbol. I don't know what happened to the brass plaque. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be here anymore. Um, but anyway, by way of saying that images are important and symbols are important, they last a lot longer sometimes than words do. So I want to take us back to early ideas of images of justice. And the first one I could, I could easily find is from 1275 BC, and it's from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And what you're looking at is an image from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and you'll see a familiar image the scales of justice, right? So even in 1275 BC, I would, uh, has, I'm by no means an expert on the Egyptian Book of the Dead, but I would guess that um, when they finally got around to writing down these ideas, these are ideas that predate 
1275. But you have the scales of justice, and because this is the book of the dead, this is the, the judgment at death of a body. So on one side of the scale, you have a small little urn, and that is to represent the heart. And on the other side, on the other balance scale, you have the feather of justice. And there's an, that idea of that justice is a balance and that the scales are an image that we will see over and over and over again. So jumping ahead hundreds of years to the Greeks, and we have Themis, the Greek goddess of justice. Now she is looking absolute that she could be here today in the 21st century. We have a woman. This is where uh, justice becomes female, it's an important idea, always female after this, robed, beautiful statue. She's got the scales of justice in one hand and a double-edged sword in the other. The double-edged sword, of course, is a big, not very subtle reminder that law is based on the use of force, right? And that, now, the idea that she's got it pointing down is suggestive of the fact that she's not immediately reaching for it. But it's easy, easily at hand. So let's move to the Romans. And now we have the name that we know today. If you look at the Supreme Court of Canada out front, there's a, a statue called Justitia. And it's the Romans who give her this name. She's not a goddess for the Romans. She's just a concept. But you see, again, the familiar ideas. She's female. She's robed. She's got a double-edged sword. This time she doesn't have scales of justice. She has a book of laws, right? But the idea is, and this, by the way, sits right over the entrance to the Palace of Justice in Rome. Now, skipping ahead even more hundreds of years to the Italian Catholic Renaissance. Now, I separate the Catholic Renaissance from the Protestant Renaissance. So here's Raphael's Justitia from 1520. Again, familiar, female, robed, scales of justice. The oddity here is the ostrich. Okay. At least I think it's odd. Um, it, it, it even doesn't even quite look like it's supposed to be there. But she does have her hand around the ostrich. And apparently, according to Raphael, the ostrich was an embodiment of the vices and maybe a few virtues, but primarily the vices. So this is the 1520 Italian version of Justitia. Now, as I said, I'm going to look now at the Protestant Renaissance because it's here that we start to see, whoops, entering the standpoint. Oops, okay, maybe it's just here. Okay, we're, up, we're all right up there. Okay, so it, um, here we actually get the moment where Justitia is gaining her blindfold. Okay? So this is Albrecht Dürer, very famous um, painter of the time. This is from a book that was called The Ship of Fools. It's actually well worth looking at because it literally is woodcut after woodcut of all the fools <laughs> in society all crammed onto a ship. But, um, the interesting part for me is the dichotomy be be between the text and the image. So the text has says, who fights like children tooth for tooth and thinks that he can blind the truth. But the image is blinding justice. So query, I mean, justice and truth, the same thing. And I think Durer's raising that question in front of us. But again, you see the familiar image of justice. She's female, she's robed, she's got the double-edged sword, she has the scales of justice. But she is now um, acquiring a blindfold. So this image now of blind justice is with us. And it is with us right up till today. We see this statue from Hans Gang in Justitia, 1543 in Bern, Switzerland. This one's still standing there. If you want to, uh, if you ever find yourself in Bern, you can take a look for it. Um, but it's not always Justitia who's blind. This idea that there's, 
that there is a blindness going on in the law. This, I realize this is very difficult to see, um, in the details of, but it's called, it's by Barthelemy Anno, and it's another woodcut called Jurisprudentia from 1554. In this image, it's not justice who's blind, it's the lawyers. Now, it's hard, hard to see, but the lawyers are all blindfolded on the bottom. And Justitia is well sighted and appears to even be reading a book. No sword in this one. So they're playing around with the imagery. Now, this is the one that I really want to take you through because I think that this is Bruegel's piece, and he called it Justitia. It's actually a charcoal drawing first done in like uh, 1559, 15, late 1550s. This version that you have is actually an engraving version that appeared in a book and a couple of years later, so 51, uh, 1561, 62. The interesting thing for me is that it's actually the reverse of the charcoal. So the image that you see, the images, for example, down on the bottom uh, left corner that you're looking at, in Bruegel's original piece is actually flipped around the other way, which means, uh, and, and it has meaning, because you, in those days, would be reading the painting the same way we read writing, from left to right. Unfortunately, the charcoal version, I couldn't get a good image for you to look at. So you're going to look at this backwards, OK? Uh, but this is the way it is in the book, in the, in the engraved book. So what is this image here that he calls justitia, and that we have um, so I'm going to take it apart for you in thirds. So the bottom third, the middle third, and the top third. And so let's just take a look at ah, the bottom third. So I'm calling this, Bruegel's to call it this, I'm calling this the rule of law section. Okay? But you could also call this the process of law or the mechanics of law section. Okay? So if you look in the corner here, this is the courtroom his illustration of the courtroom. So you have your two defendants, the defendants all the way through this, the accused and the people who are being mm, the subjects of the law, shall we say, are always uh, without hats. Okay. People who deliver justice all wear hats. So here we are with the two defendants. You'll see one of them has a cross in his hand. We have the judge, and you can see the, actually let me zone in a little bit more on this, because I think I do. Yes, okay, so you can see a little bit better. The judge seated here, one, two, three, down here, four, five, six. And we have the police, or whoever it is, that, I'm not sure if this is army or police, but law enforcement, let's put it that way, bringing the defendants in before the court. So this is the charges section of the rule of law. You'll notice that Justitia has her back to it and has is, is quite removed from any kind of concept of what of the people being brought before the law. So let's look at the other side of the painting. And what you have here is called the water cure. Okay. So what you have is a the man who's got the charge, he's charged. Now he has not been found guilty yet. This is actually a means of extracting evidence. Okay, this is not punishment for being found guilty of a crime. So he's being stretched on a rack, and there's water being poured into his mouth, and looks to be like this man here is dripping hot oil on him, and this man over here is winding the rack to stretch him. Now you notice it's called a cure. Okay? Really interesting idea back then, which is that this is about the law of evidence. They are extracting him in order to get evidence. And of course, the gold standard in any evidence is a confession. So this has got lots of ideas. They called it putting the question to the patient who is going to be cured by this water torture. Okay, And it's for the good of the patient. Now, I want you to hang on to that idea that what is being done to people in the system of law is um, for their own good, because we're going to see that arise in the modern context quite often. So this is the, they're getting the evidence here. And then we move to the 
This is, again, the whole section. We're going to move now to the middle section, which is where you get to what I call the corporal punishment part of the painting. So in this section, there's quite a few things going on here. In the alcove, there's an amputation with a butcher's knife and club. There's a flogging happening in another part of the, of the story. This is called strapado, or corda, and it's it is where the hands are tied behind the back and attached to the ankles. The person is then strung up um, in that arched position from a rope on a pulley. It would always result in dislocation of the shoulders and likely permanent disfigurement. And finally, we have down in another corner a beheading about to happen. So this is the corporal punishment that is the result of the bottom part of the picture. So this is the rule, the mechanism of the justice system. And then this is the hmm, remedies, or the cures, or the punishments. And now let's take a look at the top part of the painting here. Because what you have up here are, there's a crucifix here. These are called breaking wheels. They are long poles hung up. There's a little platform on it, and people who have been had various other forms of cures performed on them are left up there, mostly to die. There are gallows here with several people hanging from them. And we have over on this sort the side of the painting someone being burned at the stake. It's 1559. I would guess it's a woman who's being charged with being a witch. Um, so notice how many hundreds of people are being corralled in here. It's not clear to me whether they're being corralled in as witnesses or whether they're being corralled in because they're next um, for the punishment, but they are being corralled by many, many, many soldiers. And one of the striking things about this painting that Bruegel has done is the number of people who are engaged in implementing the law versus the number of people who are the subjects of the law. And there are quite a few. It takes quite a few people to do the water cure and to keep that going. So the other part down here is there's a small candle here. And that's um, theoretically the idea that these kinds of things usually happen in small dark dungeons somewhere. And there's need of a candle to illuminate them. There are lots of other symbols in here. These shields up in the corner would be shields of the municipal authority. Remember, we're in Protestant Europe. This is probably in Holland or um, somewhere, somewhere. I think Germany or Holland, but probably Holland. And these would be symbols of the authorities of the magistrates. And in on this, almost like a chandelier here, has racks of antlers on it. That's actually a symbol of their rights over the land. The rights to what in law we used to call the profita prandra, right? The profits of the land. And that means that those things that you can take from the land, the fish, the deer, the resources of the land, the timber, that's what those were, that's a symbol that those belong to the people who own the shields up here. The the wealthy and the upper classes. So this begs the question, to my mind, of Justicia is standing in the middle of this. She's on a platform. She's blindfolded. She's got her sword wielded. And it's not just down this time. It's up. And, but she's absolutely isolated from everything that's going on around her. She's not watching it. She's not a participant. She's not approving it or disproving it. And yet all of this is happening in her name. So I think. And, and I leave it to you as a question. What is justice blind to? Now, we talk about justice as being blind in our day and age, blind to race and gender and class, so that justice is neutral and justice is impartial. I don't think that's the message that Bruegels is giving us in one of the very, very early depictions of the bl of blind justice. I don't think that's, and I think it actually matches up with Durer's suggestion that justice and the truth are, mm, <laughs> are we talking about the same thing? I think that there's a, a theme going on here in Protestant 
Renaissance times that is drawing our attention to, and this would, just remember too, this would be in a time period where most people wouldn't be able to read, right? So this is, that's like the Sistine Chapel, right? There's a reason why it's set out the way it is. It's a story, it's like cartoon book. It's a book of cartoons. You look at this and it tells the story of Adam and Eve, and you look at this and it tells the story of, of the creation of the world, and it tells this and it tells that, and this is exactly what Bruegels is doing. He's inviting you to read the story of the law and the story of justice and ask yourself whether the mechanism of the law or the rule of the law is actually justice. I leave that question with you for now. So, in thinking about this idea of justice, I decided that I would put together my own piece of justice that I call Justitia Canadiana. And so I've done a little bit that's similar to what Bruegels did. First of all, it's busy. This is busy. This is busy too. And uh, I did put the, the legal mechanisms, the court and the lawyers and the police down in the same corner. After that, it's quite a bit different. I have a, a series of individuals. I have a bunch of symbols of, that, for me, represent some of the land disputes that are going on right now. A wall of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. Another picture of a baby reaching out for a mother's hands and birth alerts. On the top, I have various mechanisms of the law. Down the side, I have some of the reports. And I have some statistics. So I'm going to go into it a bit more. So let's look at the individuals first, because indigenous peoples, justice for indigenous peoples and justice for, as peoples, as collectives, is perhaps a little bit different than justice for individual indigenous people. So I'm going to walk you through some of these. These are, this is simply an example of the way justice is playing out for indigenous people in this country. So I'm going to start with Elzi Goulet. He is a Métis. Um, he was part of Louis Riel's um, provisional government in 1869 and 70. And after the Manitoba Act was signed and they negotiated peace and everything was all quiet in Red River, Sir Johnny MacDonald sent out troops. So I was quite interested last week to hear Pre uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau say, we would not send troops against Canadian citizens. And I think, well, you've done it in the past. Um, and this is what happened. They sent troops to Red River. And the troops were mostly made up of Orange Lodge men, um, the Métis call them Orangistes. Um, and those men, some of them took a vow to exterminate the Métis. So they went out to Red River officially as a peace mission. And they implemented what has been called a reign of terror. That reign of terror lasted for two and a half years. And the soldiers murdered people. You have to understand, this isn't war. There's no battles or anything going on. This is just troops completely out of control, um, running around Red River doing whatever they want. And they were um, murdering people. I only have Elzio Goulet here and saying, OK, he's just the first person that they murdered. They murdered uh, nine other men. They, there were arsons, they burned down houses, they destroyed property, they did home invasions, they did brutal assaults, and they did rapes. Many of the rapes were gang rapes. LZR's 17-year-old daughter was gang raped by the soldiers, and when the soldiers went to Colonel Jarvis, so you know Jarvis Street down here? <laughs> you name streets after it. It's actually not named after that colonel. It's named after his dad. Okay, but you know that's what happened. Is the fathers from the, the Canadian Compact here uh, sent their second sons, most of them, out west, so uh, to recreate the same system out west that they had created here. So Jarvis goes out there when the Métis go to him and complain about the fact that Lorette Goulet has been gang raped by the soldiers. And they know who did it, because there were witnesses. Jarvis's response was, it's none of my business. Okay, so it's none of his business what his soldiers do to rape and, and really violate this 17-year-old girl. Now, the, one of the most important parts for me about this is that Jarvis 
within the next year and a half, is about to be made one of the senior officers of the about to be created Northwest Mounted Police, which is then going to morph into the well, Canadian Mounted Police. And if you want to look at uh, Justice Deschamps' report about the embedded misogyny and racism in the art starts here. And it's never gone away. Now, the reign of terror went on for two and a half years, and it was so notorious that the New York Times ran a headline and called it a military reign of terror. Now, that astonishes me, because I think in 1871, I don't even think half the people in New York would know where Red River was. I, today, they probably don't know where Winnipeg is. So the fact that they ran a headline should give us some indication of how, how desperate and how outrageous the situation was in Red River. That's the um, law running in Red River. Of course, we have Louis Riel, Big Bear, and Poundmaker. They were charged with, um, with the, the, it's the word rebellion, right? So the word rebellion is really important. And if what we see, now I'm, I'm just reading from my book that I just wrote about that, but I, just because I have the quote. Um, so McDonald, Prime Minister McDonald at the time, and the Governor General were having a big discussion about whether to call it a rebellion or not. So they're correspondence back and forth about whether it's a rebellion. And at first they were calling it a riot, right? A common riot, right? And then they started elevating it to be a rebellion. And so I'm quoting the Governor General. He says, we have all of us been doing what we could to elevate it to the rank of a rebellion, and with so much success that we cannot now reduce it to the rank of a common riot. That's because McDonald was saying, well, maybe we should tone down our language a little bit, right? So, and he also goes on to say that they had been working hard to ensure that their acts of suppression had been described in glowing language of the press all over the world. Okay? This is rank propaganda. Right, that's going on, and the Governor General and the Prime Minister admitting, at least to themselves, what they're doing. And then McDonald says, he writes back and he says, well, we've certainly made it assume large proportions in the public eye. This has been done, however, for our own purposes, and I think it wisely done. Okay. So why does it matter? It matters because if it's a rebellion, they can charge them with treason, and they can charge Riel with high treason, and they can hang him, which was the point of this all along. Big Bear and Poundmaker went to prison. They weren't hanged, but they, the conditions in Stony Mountain Prison were so horrible that they both got very, very ill. They were let out and both died shortly after. So I'm going to skip a long way into the 1970s with Helen Betty Osborne. So, Helen Betty Osborne was 19 years old. She was coming home from school in the Paul, Manitoba. She was brutally raped and left dead in a ditch. Everybody in town knew who did it, and some, most of them knew right away. So the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry found that, that many people in the town, the Paw is not a big place. Even today, it's not a big place. 1971, it was a lot smaller. They knew who did it, and they didn't do anything about it because she was indigenous, and nobody cared about a little Indian girl at all. 16 years to even begin to do an investigation into the death of Helen Biddy Osborne. Now, J.J. Harper was shot by the police on the streets of Winnipeg for the crime of walking down the street while indigenous. The police then constructed their whole investigation to exonerate the policeman who did it and to make it look like J.J. Harper was responsible for his own death. And the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, which was done in 1991, so 20 years after Helen Betty Osborne was killed, they did an inquiry. And they found that racism, neglect, and indifference, not just on the part of the townspeople, but in the police and in the Attorney General's office. So this, you will see, is a common theme. Donald Marshall Jr. was um, wrongfully convicted and arrested for murder in 1971. The, another inquiry uh, found that the criminal justice system failed him at every turn. They also found that racism played a part in this. Neil Stonechild. These are the Starlight Tours 
a, a feature of the Saskatoon police. So Indigenous people would be picked up. Sometimes they would be arrested, but mostly they'd just be picked up and driven out of town and dumped off out of town in the middle of the night. Neil Stonechild only had one shoe. It was 30 below. They died. The only reason it came to light was in 2000 when Daryl Knight survived. All the other people that they had done it to died. Daryl Knight actually survived, and as a result of that, they did an inquiry. And at the inquiry, it came out that the practice had been going on since at least 1976. It was so notorious that it was even written up in the newspapers as if this was OK. They were called Starlight Tours. Can I add a comment? Yeah. They Normally, they take their jackets and shoes, too. Yeah. yeah. Yes, left them with like <clears throat> a shirt and, and no shoes, not bare feet to walk back, right? Yeah, and minus 40 there? degree weather. Yeah, yeah it's, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Dudley George. In this part of the world, Dudley was shot um, while they were occupying Ipperwash. Dudley was, the, the people in the park were actually roasting hot dogs when the riot squad came in with the sniper who shot Dudley George. But again, I want to point out that the Ipperwash report said that there was racism on the part of some of the OPP officers, and both the Premier and the Minister of Natural Resources made racist comments. Now, I'm not going to read Mike Harris's statement out loud, but that's a quote from the Premier of this province. And then we have Colton Bushy, very recent case. Now, the, the issue with Colton Bushy, for most people, is that it looks to Indigenous people across this country that they can be killed by white people, and the people who kill them, it's, it, there's perfect Im immunity here. They do not get charged, they, or they get charged, but they do not get found guilty of killing Indigenous people. And the cases are stacking up. There's case after case after case now. Um, and in these cases, with Bushi, Gerald Stanley admitted that he held the gun to the back of his, of his head. He admitted that, that he did this, but he still was acquitted. Um, now, Kent Roach has written a whole book on this, so I'm going to move on. Okay, Cindy Gladdy, this is the one that Cheryl and I were on at the Supreme Court of Canada about. Now, Cindy died in a bathtub. She bled to death in Edmonton. And the, she was referred to throughout the trial as Native woman. And, uh, but in fact, the fact that she was Native has absolutely nothing to do with what was going on here. Absolutely nothing. So it's a way of dehumanizing her, of making her a cartoon kind of figure throughout the court. Certainly not a real woman who might have not consented to what happened to her. Now, but the, the horrific part, it, as if her death wasn't horrific enough, because it was. But the real horror is what the state did to her. The coroner thought it was a good idea to cut up her body parts, her, specifically her vagina, her uterus, her pelvis, and actually bring it into court as evidence and essentially reenact what he thought happened in court. So reenacting the, the sexual assault and the rape in, in some ways, right? In front of the jury. The judge said it was fine. He allowed it. Now, the shocking part to me is that there was a, a voir dire to decide whether this would come in. The judge said, well, this appears to be a novel case. I was thinking, yeah, that's because it's the 21st century and it's not the 1500s anymore. But yes, it's novel because nobody else in the country has been cutting up women's body parts and bringing them in as evidence into court. Now, but they did it. They brought it in. And that judge then, after the voir dire, commented not one word on this. At the Court of Appeal, nobody said a word. And at the Supreme Court of Canada, even though I directly asked them to do it, the court was, I think, shamefully silent on this. This whole issue of whether you can cut women's bodies up and bring them into court 
Not one judge said a word about it for this whole process. And I think that is absolutely shameful. And I think there's no justice in that. And the, the worst part of this is that they're doing it again, right? Because it got sent back down for trial. And Cindy Gladue's mother and her daughters have to go through this whole process all over again. Now, this is an example of the birth alerts here. So birth alerts, for those of you who don't know, are the process whereby the law kicks in largely because of information that is in the record about Indigenous women who are giving birth in the hospital. And the social workers come with the police usually, and they take the newborn minutes sometimes after the child is born. And they take them away. Now sometimes the only information and the only reason that they're taking that child is because the mother herself was taken at birth. Not because she's on drugs or because she's uh, incapable of raising her child. Only because she herself was taken into custody and confined by the state as a child herself. Now they're not all like that. But that's it. So we call them birth alerts, and they're going on across this country today. Some of the provinces have stopped doing them, but there are so many provinces that are doing them. They're probably happening right as we speak. Now, Angel is a classic case of this, right? She was taken into care when she was an infant, and the story of her life, her short 17-year-old life, is horrific beyond belief. She was assaulted sexually the first time when she was under two years old. And she was assaulted multiple times after that. By the time she was 11, she tried to commit suicide for the first time, right? This is what our kids, and I call this the law, because it is the law that is taking these children and putting them in the care of the state. Now remember the water cure, right? We, we think that's curing people. We think it's for the good of people. This is what we think is for the good of indigenous children. Right? Angel's just an example of this, about this country today. People talk about the 60s scoop, but in fact it's worse today. More children are being taken into custody today than were in the 1960s. Now, and Angela Cardinal, this is another one. So Angela Cardinal was a victim of very brutal sexual assault, um, and that's actually a picture of her hands there. She, the, the man who assaulted her actually knifed her and it took like 27 stitches in her palm just to sew her palm back together again. But the, the horrific part of this is that Angela was actually a cooperative <coughs> victim who was in the court. And the court shackled her in leg shackles, handcuffed her, and threw her in jail. She's the victim here, right? Now this is a girl who stood up for herself. She, she said, hey judge, I'm the victim. Look at me, I'm in the shackles, and aren't you supposed to commit a crime to go to jail? She's trying to stand up for herself, right? And doesn't matter, for her own good, and this is what the judge said, and this is what the Crown Prosecutor said, for her own good, we're going to put her in jail. Now, I think those of us who are litigators and lawyers, we can imagine a time when you might need to hang on to your, your witness, right? But usually you put them in a hotel, right? You do not shackle them, handcuff them, and throw them in jail. She was also sent to and from jail in the same paddy wagon as the man who assaulted her, right? So now there is no law in our justice system that permits this to happen to a victim, absolutely none. And yet when the Justice Minister of Alberta rightly raised this as a, a horrific situation and ordered an investigation. Fifty Crown lawyers wrote a letter objecting to the Justice Minister suggesting that the prosecutor had done any, anything wrong and supporting the actions of the prosecutor. In other words, 50 other Crown lawyers in Alberta think that they too should be able to shackle and handcuff innocent victims and throw them in jail. Now, we're supposed to have a presumption of innocence here. And what's fascinating in this case is 
the guy who perpetrated this crime, he gets the presumption of innocence before he is put in jail, but she didn't. No one, we have no concept that protects her from the state. Now, in the investigation that happened, the judge who did investigate it tried very hard, I think really hard, to make her a human being so that people could appreciate that this was a real woman and that she was admirable in many ways. And he pointed out that she stood up for herself. And he also, she was asked at trial, so these, these are, whoops, okay. um, these are the things that were found at the crime scene and she was asked what those things were. And she, they asked her specifically about the little pieces of paper and did she know what they were? And she said, yeah, I, I write little poems on little pieces of paper and I keep them in my sock. And if I see somebody who's having a hard time, I give them a poem because I think it might brighten up their day. Okay, so that, that is what I see as the state of the law with respect to indigenous peoples, individuals today. Now, we have had umpteen reports. I've only clipped the front of six or seven here. But there are hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of reports. And as Kent Roach said, we have studied this to death. We know, there's no question that we know what's wrong here and that we have uh, thousands of recommendations about what to do about it. But the fact is that it's getting worse. And here's the stats, right? So indigenous women in federal prison, 41% now. The shocking, they're only 4% of the population, right? The homicide rate for indigenous women and girls is <laughs> six times higher than for non-indigenous women and girls. By the way, just being visibly indigenous is a factor that increases your, the, the likelihood that you will be um, victimized. But the shocking part for me is this part here, since 2010. So indigenous women incarceration rate has gone up 73.8% in 10 years. And the indigenous inmate population as a whole has gone up 52% in 10 years. Now the general incarceration rate has only gone up 1.2%. But the indigenous, look at that. What are we doing? Now the marvelous Kim Pate, who's now a senator and has been long a great advocate for indigenous people, and I'm just going to quote her because I think it's a really good statement. She says, query, so question, question what we're doing, folks. Query the value of enabling the creation of laws and policies that effectively criminalize poverty, disabilities, and the resistors of colonization, and then developing classification, assessment, and correction tools that pretend that the individual members of those very groups of people who are grabbed, sucked, or thrown into the criminal and correctional systems are there because of their planned, voluntary, and criminally intended actions. And I think she's nailing it there quite well. Now, I, this is a, the bottom part of this image is a, the wall of pictures of murdered and missing indigenous women. Now it's only, of course, some of them. And on the left side here is a picture from Val d'Or. Now Val d'Or, Quebec, they have their own version of the Starlight Tours, right? And what it is is the police want the women to give them sexual favors and if you don't do it, you will get dumped out in the snow. Um, so this all came to light and of course then the justice the investigation exonerated the police and found the women not to be credible witnesses, so nothing happened. But the chart at the top is clipped from the CBC, and it's about the murdered and missing women. And the reason I clip this chart is because there should be one thing that's painfully obvious to all of us, is that this is on the rise, right? This is not a chart that's going down. This is it thoroughly in line with the numbers of people who are being thrown into prison. This is exactly what's going on. Our system of law is criminalizing and victimizing and bending the full force of law on indigenous people in this country. Now, we can talk about 
Canadian justice and Indigenous justice. And I, I do want to do that because they're quite different ideas. And so basically what I want to draw your attention to is, is that I don't think our system has to be the way it is. We don't have to do this. We are doing it, but we don't have to. There are other ideas and options out there, and the biggest ideas and the best ideas come from Indigenous people's systems of justice themselves. So in Canadian justice, we don't actually talk about justice. We talk about process. We talk about due process. We talk about the impartial implementation of the law. We talk about the consistent application of the law. This whole mechanism, right? It's all about process. We think if the process is fair, that equates to justice, right? We think that issues can be dissected into very discrete ideas, and that will get you justice. We think that the Canadian law is neutral. I, I have people, actually judges, we have the best justice system in the whole world, and nothing needs to change. I would like to point out to you that Canada is the only common law jurisdiction in the world that does not have a law reform commission. The Canadian law protects every Canadian citizen. That's another myth or big overstory idea. Now look at what just Aboriginal people say. They say due process has nothing to do with justice. They say that the implementation of the rule of law is not impartial, and I think I've just showed you that they've got a pretty good argument to say that. They say that consistent application of the law, well, it's being consistently applied to them, but is that justice? I think they think it's, and, and report after report after report says it's systemic racism at play, that Canadian law is not neutral, and that it doesn't protect indigenous peoples as peoples or as individuals. Now, down the bottom here, I've got a few pieces of our law. So this is a script certificate. This is what they, they issued for Métis people on the prairies to uh, arbitrarily extinguish their Aboriginal title. This is the Articles of a Treaty. Um, the one in the middle is an Inuit identification tag. We numbered people, right? They all have a number and a tag. And that's right next to a status Indian card. I put a picture of the Supreme Court of Canada because we have over 60 decisions, I think, now on Indigenous people since 1990. I believe it's the single most litigated section of that uh, is before the Supreme Court of Canada and it's since 1990. And then, of course, we have the Criminal Code. And this last one that is very hard to see is actually a pass that was required by Indians to leave the reserve for a long time. You weren't allowed to leave the reserve. So now, what is indigenous justice? I just told you all the things that they don't like. In a nutshell, it's restorative. The whole idea is restorative. The whole idea is that, I think I have some more. Um, actually, I'm going to go back a bit. Um, the whole idea is that it's not about rules, and it's not about systems, and it isn't that process gives you justice. It's about listening, it's about sitting down, it's about trying to figure out what's wrong, but not, see our criminal justice system is a minute search for detail, right? What time did you arrive at the scene of the crime? What color of coat were you wearing? You know, what side of the street were you on? All of those kinds of things by which then we add up this pile of facts and someone arrives at a statement as to whether you are guilty or not guilty. And indigenous people say, this is not helpful because throwing someone in jail isn't helpful. All you're doing is delaying the fact that they're going to come out and they're going to do what they did before anyway. So you haven't solved the problem at all. In fact, you probably made it worse. So somebody who goes in common theft but ends up, for various reasons, staying there for a very long time, comes out as a seasoned, hardened criminal who's going to do a lot worse than steal a purse or pick up a TV at Shopper's Drug Mart, right? So what we've got here is a different idea. Indigenous people say, the way to solve this is to not get engaged in the minutia of what happened, but to try and look at how you're going to solve it. What are you going to do about this problem? How are you going to fix it? 
What are you gonna do with the perpetrator? And what are you gonna do with the person who was hurt here? How are you gonna fix this? We never ask that question. And to my mind, that's stupefying that our justice system never says, what should we do about this problem? We don't ask that. All we do is put out punishment. And I think anybody in this room who's been a parent knows that punishment isn't actually the best way to change the behavior of people. It doesn't change things. So indigenous justice has a different idea of going about it, and quite frankly, I think it's a better idea. Now, I just want to briefly go through the land um, issues, because it's different than the, indigenous, the individual <coughs> issues, right? So Canada's got land claims here. And again, I'm just going to say I did do this before the Wet'suwet'en <laughs> um, issue came up. Um, Canada's claim to sovereignty rests on three ideas, right? They say they own all the land. Canada owns all the land. Canada gets to make all the decisions about the land, how to use the land, and they get the benefits of the land. Now, getting the benefits of the land might mean that they get to decide that a company gets the benefits of the land. But essentially, they're the decision makers about everything to do with the land, right? And this is in flat, whoops, contradiction to what indigenous people would say, which is that they own the land, and they get to make the decisions about it, and they get the benefits of the land. So these are two entirely incompatible concepts right now, and that's what we're watching play out, is the, the, those two things coming to loggerheads. But the point is that I want to make is that since 1973, in the Calder case, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized that Indigenous title exists in the country, this country as a legal idea, and that that has, and that it's attached to law, title, it's law, and that it carries other things. We have multiple other, um, other judgments now that have um, filled in some of the blanks on that and made it, um, made it even more solid in the law. So the Chilcotin case, the Dalgamut case, they all point out that it's law. It's got land ownership with it. It's got the right to make decisions about the lands. It's got all of those territorial concepts attached to it. So what I say to you is that Canada is wrong. And the courts have said this since 1973. Now, take a look at that. That's like a third of the time. That's, that's like a third of the time that Canada's been in existence. We've known that what is going on is wrong. And we're not doing anything about it. Or we're doing it so in such small ways. Because Canada then thinks, well, OK, if you've got existing Aboriginal title, then we have to extinguish it. right? And I think what you're seeing is how well that's working. right? And I'd suggest to you that it's not working well at all. So the issues here then are, what are we going to do about this? Is there reconciliation here? Is there a possibility? How do we bring these ideas together? And I think that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is actually the only roadmap we have. I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch, which is simply across the globe, and I mean this sincerely, on this whole planet, there is no other roadmap to even start to look at, except this. It's the only one available. The other ones, all the other way we're proceeding right now in Canada is we managed to get our law to take precedent, and so we're going to try and hang on to that ride as long as we can, right? I think that some of the ideas in here are helpful to us. So. One of the things that the United Nations says is it's urgent, right? Now, I think um, Canada should be agreeing with that. We saw what has happened with the shutdowns of systems across this country. And that's, it's so fascinating to me to watch this, the fact that these are like, they're like pop-up things going on, right? No one, and honestly, the honest truth is no one's organizing this, right? This is just happening. People are jumping up over here and over there and over here. And 
This should be telling us something. There's a big message here called pay attention, right? So the, it's urgent, I agree. It's urgent. We have to try and solve this problem, right? So urgent need, but the urgent need isn't to shut them down. The urgent need is to try and resolve this issue here. And the way to do that is to respect and promote indigenous people's rights to their lands and territories. The other one is that um, we have to work on recognition right, of those rights. And that includes principles of justice, democracy, and respect for human rights. These are the principles that we need to be working on. And right now, we're not. Now, in Canada today, all of these rights that we're talking about, number two up there, the right to be free from any kind of discrimination. I think I just walked you through a whole story about that. Number seven, that includes forcibly removing children. That's the birth, al the, those birth alerts that we were talking about. Section 22.2, they have the right, states shall take measures to ensure that indigenous women and children enjoy full protection against all forms of violence and discrimination. So I would say that this is uh, today, every one of those rights is being violated by the Canadian state. Now, <clears throat> indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights. They have the right to their lands, territories, and resources. They have the right to use, own, and develop the lands and control the lands and territories. And states shall give legal recognition and protection to it. Okay, this is not the model that's the consultation model that's out there right now, right? That's not what's going on. So this is a room full of lawyers, right? So consultation was, and I, I want to talk about this because I was one of the lawyers on the case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada on this case. So I was one of the lawyers with Arthur Pape on the Tucker River Clinket case, and Louise Mandel was the lawyer for the Haida. All the way up through the courts, the Tucker River case was first. We went to judicial review first, we went to the Court of Appeal first, and Haida was running behind us. They only got joined together at the Supreme Court of Canada. So both of these cases are about the land, right? So the Tucker River case was about a road that was going to go through pristine territory, the breadbasket of the Tucker River Clinkets, and it was gonna go to an old mine. And the Haida case was about logging on Haida Gwaii, right? Particularly logging of old growth cedar, which is tremendously important to them culturally. Um, and so what happened was we went to these uh, judicial reviews, and we were both cases, we were going to rely on our claim to Aboriginal title. And Arthur and I cooked up this idea that we could claim title because we had filed for to participate in the BC Treaty process, and you had to file a huge, big historical report about what your title was, and then the government would review it, and they get their own people to write one, and if they agreed that you, then, then they would enter into treaty negotiations. Well, they had agreed to enter into treaty negotiations with us. So we thought, okay, well, let's just move and say we agreed that there's some form of title here, and we'll move on to talk about the problem with the mine and the road. Big problem was the road. And uh, the Crown immediately moved to sever off the title issues and said, no, no, that has to go to trial. So Arthur Pape and I went out that night, um, and the court agreed to sever that off. And we went out that night and had a fair amount of alcohol because we were very upset. We thought, oh, that's it, we've lost, we have lost this case because we can't prove title. And in the course of the evening, we called a wonderful um, civil lawyer in British Columbia who's since passed on. His name was Rick Sugden. He was a really well-respected civil lawyer, not an indigenous rights uh, expert at all. But we figured, Arthur and I, that we had a real, um, it was a really legal problem here that didn't necessarily need the, the expert on indigenous rights. We were the experts on indigenous rights. We needed somebody to help us with the, the other parts. So Rick kindly came down and talked to us. And at the end, he finally just said, look, you guys, you're, I, I can barely keep up with what you're talking about because I'm so far out of my 
um, wheelhouse. But I'm just going to tell you that I think that the only thing you can do is try and find a way to salvage the case by moving it forward. So what can you agree on to move forward? So Arthur and I went home that night and got up the next morning. I know I had a headache. I don't know if he did. But um, we went in and we had both come up with a theory. And it came from the fact that both Arthur and I did a lot of work in labor law. Um, so this is the cross-pollination of different fields of law. I, it's always really good to have different influences coming in. But so we reached for the idea of consultation and accommodation, which is a very common concept in labor law. And we decided that we would try and apply that to here. So we went forward with that, that they had a duty to consult with us and that they had a duty to accommodate it. Now, we didn't have all the right words right away. It took us a while. We were still grappling with the ideas. Arthur and um, Leslie Pinder from Mandel Pinder were best friends, so there was cross-pollination going on between the law firms, and they were running behind us um, on the Haida case. And so we got to the Supreme Court of Canada, and we were working on this idea of consultation and accommodation. So what I, what I really want to say is that this was, consultation was our fallback. It was, uh, the image I used earlier today, it, it, there are so few tools in the indigenous rights toolbox that, and this was the creation of one, and the only reason we got it put in there was because the court recognized that we couldn't use the usual tools, and so they threw us a bone, is really what happened. But you can't build a house on duct tape. Now I have to tell you, duct tape is very useful. Okay. <laughs> I have been on canoe trips and punched a hole in the front of my canoe, and I've patched it up with duct tape and made it back. Okay, But it doesn't mean I'm going to go out the next time in my canoe with duct tape over my canoe. right? It's a temporary fix that might get you over the rapids for a while. Now, some conclusions. I still think that we have got a real issue here with respect to how we deal with the rule of law and how we put this together with our Canadian system. So what we have here is Justice, who's still blindfolded, and might be said to have her beady little eye thoroughly fixed on Indigenous people. Uh, certainly looking at those statistics about people who are, um, our people who are in court. And then this picture. These are, to my mind, they're just the opposite sides of the picture. This is exactly what Bruegels was writing about or painting about in the 1550s, and here we are in today dealing with the same thing. Now, I'll leave you with this. This was in the Globe and Mail just the other day. <laughs> and I, uh, I thought, I think it's interesting. You notice that the scales of justice are broken, right? And he likes the sword, right? Um, and he's grabbed the rope. He likes the trappings of the office, right? But he sure doesn't want the blindfold, right? So justice is uh, going to be meted out. But but I think I think it's an interesting discussion for us to have about where we're at with reconciling justice and the rule of law with Indigenous peoples. I think we're we have a long way to go. And if I can offer some thoughts about it. I think that that it is possible, and we have some models here. So these are some of the wampum belts that I actually beaded for this law school. And wampum belts are part of a tradition in Eastern Canada. So this is the, um, sorry, name's escaping me. AJ, help me. What's it called? 
I forgot too. That's a Gaswanta. The Gaswanta? Okay. Yeah. So the Gaswanta. No, no, it's, no, it's not, is it? It's that's, not. That's a confederacy. The Holy yeah. Confederacy. Yeah. So it's the confederacy, right? <clears throat> so this is the the Iroquois confederacy. It's got a name. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. But it has the name. It's the Iroquois confederacy. But if you notice, it's before the Six Nations. It's five nations here, right? So that means it's pre 17 early 1700s because the uh, Tuscarora have not come up and joined yet, mm -hmm. right? But the, this is a statement of, of um, confederation between the nations, and it's a statement of law, right? So it, it also gives you some idea of how old laws are. This one is also very interesting. This one was actually designed and built by um, Europeans, right, and given to indigenous people in 1764, and it's part of the the implementation and proclamation of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, right? And so they had this design. You see indigenous people holding hands. Um, you see that there's there's no sword or anything in the middle. That these are chains here, the covenant chain, and um, the date on it. So another statement of relationship and law, like a United Nations kind of uh, thing. And then this last one I'll show you is the, um, this is the Vatican belt. And this is done by, with the Mi'kmaq. And basically, if you can see, it's hard to hold up and show you, but this is a black robe here, a, a priest. And they're holding onto a, cro a, a cross here. And this is a chief. These are the nations of the Mi'kmaq. And basically, it is a statement. You see the peace pipe on the end and the church with an open door down here. So this, um, now these are syllabics. And I understand they're taken from the Bible. Um, so what this, and this is the keys to the church, right? So this is a statement of peace between the Mi'kmaq and the Catholic Church. So back in those days, this would be the Jesuits there, right? So that's what, what this is. It's very, very old. This is from the 1600s, right? So you've got, these are our ancient, ancient ways of making agreements, solemn covenants, <coughs> contracts is what they are, right? And uh, in some ways, they're much more durable than paper. So. We have lots of those. You have a two-row wampum belt upstairs um, in, or not, I guess it's in the other building right now. So I think in conclusion, <laughs> I, what I really wanted to just wind up and say that I don't think we have reconciled indigenous peoples with this country at all. And I think that what you're seeing as we watch what's going on that is, um, that is instigated by what's going on with the Wet'suwet'en, but is being picked up by the Mohawks and by various peoples all across the country, is an indication of what the shaky foundation that this country's law rests <coughs> on. Right? We have not really resolved the title issue here. Canada came in and claimed title, but didn't really eliminate indigenous title. And for many years, when indigenous peoples were too weak to complain about it, they got away with it. I would say what you're watching <coughs> today is the fact that indigenous peoples sent a whole bunch of us to law school, <laughs> myself included, some other people in this room, people all across the country. We are not uneducated, dumb Indians anymore. And we're going to use the law to stand up and get some justice in this country. Because quite frankly, the overstory and the understory are the same. The overstory and the understory are both. That justice for indigenous peoples is uh, something that has not yet been attained and in almost every circumstance. And I think that's why you're seeing the rise of people in prison, and you're seeing the rise of 
the anger across the country and the willingness to stand up and fight. We have been doing this for a very long time. These, they're, they're like little outbursts, right? You can think of Restigouche, and you can think of Oka, and you can think of, of um, Gustafson Lake, and, and lots of others. There's lots and lots and lots of them. I think those days of them being isolated outbursts are over, and Canada needs to sit down and actually start working with Indigenous peoples. And it doesn't mean by imposing our laws. It means by working together. So those old treaties where they were extinguishing everybody's rights and imposing Canadian systems on everything, those days are over. You sent us to law school, and we are using it uh, to insist on justice, because justice is the one thing that has been not reconciled for Indigenous people. It can be, but it isn't right now. So I'm going to stop there and open the floor up and see if anybody has any questions.